Hello everyone. I am Monish Penta, a software engineer at Video Infra here at Meta. Today, on behalf of Video Infra, my partner Jitin Thomas and I are excited to talk about the growth and evolution of Meta's VOD backend infrastructure that supports processing and delivery. We will share our journey over the past few years during which we re-architected the backend to transition from an app-specific vertical stack to a shared horizontal stack that is currently adopted across Meta's apps like Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, Workplace, and Oculus. The defragmentation of our backend has significantly improved our resource efficiency and developer productivity. Let's take a quick look at our agenda. The talk is divided into four sections. In order to get a better sense of how it all started and how we got here, we'll start with discussing the growth of Meta's video ecosystem. Then we'll talk about the challenges that the growth brought us in scaling the video backend. Then we'll dive deeper into all the work that the team has done over the past few years to address some of these challenges. And then we'll finally conclude discussing all the wins and improvements that this work helped us get. So without spending much time, let's get right into it. But before we get into the details of growth and evolution, let's understand the scale of the platform. Meta's video backend currently powers some of the largest and the most popular social video apps by engagement and scale on the planet. Now with that into perspective, let's try and see how we got here. The timeline gives us a sneak preview of some of the launches and milestones that we have seen over the years. It marks some of the key events since the launch of Facebook and Messenger video platform, acquisition of Instagram and Oculus, and launches of popular products like Reels and Stories. Now, let's get into specific details and see how the video backend evolved during this time. The slide here is discussing and talking about a snapshot of different areas that were evolved. Let's start with apps. As you must have noticed, there were some incremental changes that happened in this area over the past few years. At the company level, Facebook video platform started in-house, native to the app. Instagram and Oculus were acquired and evolved separately. Messenger also evolved as a separate platform. On the product side, social video landscape has evolved at one of its fastest pace in the past decade, witnessing rapid adoption and pushing the video uploads and views higher. Lastly, there was a lot of progress happening in the space of video compression technology. We went from H.264 to VP9 to AV1 currently. At the same time, Audio quality had quite a few enhancements too. While the progress and the growth was amazing, there were some key areas that started coming up, which posed challenges in scaling the backend. Let's take a look at what these challenges were. Number one challenge that we saw was fragmentation in the backend infrastructure. The second challenge was need for cross-posting across Meta's apps. And the third was scaling efficiently as our backend group. Let's Take a look at each of these challenges in a little more detail. Let's start with the first challenge, fragmented backend infrastructure. As we have seen on the evolution timeline earlier, multiple video processing stacks emerged within the company and were evolving in silos with a lot of features that were common but developed more than once. While this was fine in the early days, as it helped apps bootstrap quickly and launch features, things quickly became tricky as new products were launched and video features became more advanced. Typically, our video backend stack comprises of four to five different core components like processing, data model, delivery, experimentation, and resource management. As we see in this picture, with time, the stacks evolved more vertically with very less sharing. In fact, achieving sharing in this setup was very difficult. This led to some of the following issues. First, was higher cost to replicate the same feature across the stack. For example, putting VP9 in products needed a lot of rework rather than having a unified strategy. Second, the duplication led to a lot of maintenance overhead, gradually trickling down to code surfacing as site incidents. Developer productivity was not great. Developers spent a lot of time navigating across stacks and ramping up new engineer was difficult. Combination of all led to slower pace of development and launch of new features and products. Most importantly, 
all of this was going in the opposite direction of one of Meta's core principles of move fast. The second challenge that we were facing was need for more video cross-posting across Meta's apps. In a nutshell, as video products like Reels and Stories became more cross-app, the need for video cross-posting became a default requirement. It helped creators upload once and share it across apps to get better reach. While this was a great functionality for our customers, the fragmented infrastructure made things a lot tricky and complex. Weighing the pros and cons and the options for the options available back then, the team decided to cater to the requirement by re-uploading and reprocessing videos to the respective apps each time users decided to share. While it helped solve the problem at hand and launch, but as growth caught up, caught up things quickly became tricky. It started amplifying some of the core issues. Number one was duplicate compute and storage. Second, higher latency. While these were the issues manifesting from the very fact that each time a share happened, we re-uploaded and reprocessed the videos. The third important issue here was inconsistent playback experience. We saw issues around video quality each time a video was cross-posted to a different app. Now, as discussed earlier, video tech was evolving in silos. So were the compression technologies. What this meant was there was a difference in encoding settings and the compression tech across every app. This was an issue that was highlighted to us by our creators since this started affecting their engagement. The third issue and one of the important ones, the team realized that we needed efficient resource utilization. As we discussed earlier, in the last few years, we have witnessed the fastest pace of development in the social video landscape. The innovations have made its way to higher UGC, pushing the rate of organic growth higher. While at the same time, the compute and storage saw limited growth and did not grow at the same rate. The delta was pretty big. Well, the third important aspect that the team realized was learning the video watch patterns. We started seeing skew in the watch time distribution. What we found out was typically one third of the videos were essentially responsible for most of the watch time on the platform. Now, these three factors made it evident that we need to think from ground up rather than addressing the issues with efficiency in silos. To summarize, with all the growth now that we were witnessing, there were these six main areas where inefficiencies escalated to bottlenecks and eventually became the main drivers to making re-architecture a necessity rather than a good to have. The team identified that the issues were related and had a common theme as we discussed in the prior slides. This pushed the need for a holistic solution to be thought from the ground up. Now at this point, I would like to invite my partner Jitin Thomas who will discuss all the work that the team has done in the past few years to address some of these challenges. Jitin, over to you. All right. Thank you, Mohanish. Hi, everyone. I'm Chitin. I'm from Video Infra here at Meta. I've been building and modernizing the VOD backend for Meta's platform. Now that we've seen the context of Meta's video ecosystem, the fragmented backend that supported it, and the challenges that we faced, let's take a look at how we address these. Our solution was composed of two parts. The first one was to unify our backend. This meant replacing the vertical app-specific silos that we had with horizontal services that could be shared by apps across Meta's platform. The second part was unifying the video data model. We replaced app-specific data models with an app-agnostic data model that could be shared across apps to represent videos and video-related artifacts. Let's dive deeper. On the left-hand side, you can see a diagram of what we had previously. As you've already seen, we had these app-specific silos, which kind of replicated functions across them. This roughly included processing, delivery, experimentation, resource management, and data modeling. We replaced these vertical stacks with horizontal services that could be shared by apps all across Meta. At the bottom, you'll see the unified processing service. This exposes functions such as transcoding or compression, media composition or server-side editing, thumbnail extraction, encryption for DRM, and a host of other functions. The outputs of this processing service are then stored in a unified data model schema. And above this, we've built higher level services such as delivery, 
experimentation, and resource management that can be shared by all apps. Now, different apps plug into these shared services by specifying their policies as configurations. Let's dive a little deeper into this. So here's an overview of the control flow of a video throughout its lifecycle within Meta's platform. The first stage in the lifecycle of a video is, of course, upload. The client starts transferring the media bytes to our backend blob storage through a service called Upload Service. Once the transfer is done, the next step is for the client to make a graphical call to an upload endpoint. The next stage is media inspection. This is where we examine the uploaded media, verify that it's not malicious, and extract key properties of the media, such as bitrate, codec, resolution, duration, and other attributes. This information is then later used by apps to determine the best set of encodings to, de to generate for that particular video. Once inspection is done, the next stage is running a set of upload processing pipelines. These pipelines were expressed as DAGs of operations. Each node in the DAG represents a task. This could include compression, thumbnail extraction, packaging, and so on. The edges between these nodes represent sequential dependencies. The DAGs themselves are run by a DAG processing service. And each node in the DAG could leverage our Lambda service, which is a priority-aware serverless compute farm that runs these jobs at scale. The outputs of these nodes and tasks are then stored in app-specific data models. This includes encodings and thumbnails. Once the processing is complete, the video is now ready for playback and can be published. When a video needs to be viewed by a viewer, the client, the playback client, makes a call to our delivery GraphQL endpoint. This is to generate a dash XML manifest that it can then use for dash playback. A delivery on the delivery side, we have app-specific logic to examine the encodings available for a video and filter out the most optimal set based on the viewer's device characteristics, network conditions, and a host of other factors. Once again, this logic is app-specific. Besides playback and upload, we also have a host of other backend services that tune and optimize our resource usage. This includes ROI-driven processing, which attempts to generate more advanced encodings with better compression efficiency for videos that have better engagement. We also have storage optimization jobs that aim to reduce our storage footprint without degrading user experience. Now let's compare this to the unified video backend. The key difference to note here is that we've replaced all of those app-specific functions or monolithic pipelines with a shared backend. The app-specific portions have now been reduced to very thin clients and snippets of configuration that express app policies. On the upload side, we still have the client using upload service to transfer the bytes to our backend blob storage. And after inspection, we send a callback to app-specific clients to now process the incoming upload. The clients then leverage the shared processing service to generate the necessary encodings, thumbnails, and to do server editing and packaging and a host of other functions to make the video ready for playback. The shared processing service itself is composed of three services under the hood. One is the data model service. This is the one that mutates and stores artifacts in our unified data model. Then we have a media transform service, which is a workflow system that exposes functions to compress videos to extract thumbnails and a host of other things. And then we have the Lambda service, which as I mentioned, is a priority aware serverless compute farm to run these jobs at scale. At playback time, the client again makes a call to a delivery graphical endpoint. And this time, instead of using app-specific logic, we leverage the unified video delivery service to generate the dash manifest for playback. In a similar way, we've also unified our ROI-driven processing systems and storage compaction services. Now to summarize, we had these functions at varying levels of sophistication across apps prior to the unification. But with this move, we not only defragment our infrastructure, but also able to expose the cutting edge technology we have in every one of these functions to every app within Meta. We build once and ship all the time. Let's take a look at the data model side of things as well. At Meta, entities are represented as nodes within our social graph store. So let's come to the example of a story video that is cross-posted from Facebook to Instagram. Now within this graph store, we also have a concept called universes. These universes separate nodes into logical partitions to ensure isolation of data and schemas and policies. 
In this diagram, the blue nodes represent the Facebook story. As you can see, there's a node for the user, for the story, for the video, and for the artifacts of that video, including thumbnails and encodings. Now, when the video is cross-posted from Facebook to Instagram, although we already have thumbnails and encodings ready, we have no way of reusing them on the Instagram side. This is because nodes that belong to two different universes are incompatible with each other. They cannot have edges between them. This meant that on cross-posting, we had to reprocess the video on Instagram side. This resulted in higher latency, it increases chances of failure, which means lower reliability, and we also have to duplicate our compute and storage processes and base resources. How did we address them? We took advantage of another feature within our graph store called the shared multiverse. Nodes in the multiverse are different in that they can have edges from nodes that belong to other universes. Let's take a look at the same example of a story video cross-posted from Facebook to Instagram. In this case, we still have the parent nodes, user, story, and video that belong to the Facebook universe. But what's different here? The artifacts that we generate through the unified processing service are now stored in a shared multiverse. And the Facebook node takes a link to the shared asset. In this case, cross-posting becomes a lot easier. We don't have to reprocess the video on the Instagram side, but rather we could do a copy by reference. All we have to do is add a link from the Instagram side to the shared asset. This reduces latency of cross-posting, increases reliability, and we also don't have to duplicate compute and storage resource usage. Now, I would like to invite my friend Monish back to walk us through some of the key wins the, that we unblock from this migration. Monish, over to you. All right. Thanks a lot, Jitin, for the deep dive and sharing all the work that the team has done over the past few years. The new Infra has inbuilt support for seamless video cross-posting addressing most of the issues that we have seen earlier. Along with common API and standardization across services, it has also promoted common tooling, which in turn has boosted developer productivity and helped faster onboarding. The work around ROI-driven view time encode processing has greatly helped in streamlining the resource utilization. And the list goes on. Briefly, but I would like to also mention the new avenues that the work has helped open up like centralized resource attribution and management. Now, before we conclude, we would love to share some of the key wins that this work has helped us achieve. Number one, resource wins. We were able to achieve around 50% reduction in the compute and storage spent in videos that were cross-posted. On the user experience side, we were able to reduce the cross-posting latency by approximately 50%, talking about time to market, and developer productivity wins, we were able to achieve around 60% of reduction in the development and the experimentation life cycle of launching a new feature, for launching a new feature. And lastly, for better systems, we were able to reduce the code and code and configuration by around 80% delivering the same functionality. Well, at this point, this marks the end of this talk. On behalf of Jitin and Video Infra, we would love to thank each one of you for taking time to attend this session. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.